All right, I want to um, take some time and engage your imagination. So with me right now, think, when you see Jesus walking with his closest friends and followers, as he walks through the countryside, what kind of images do you think of? Primarily, for most of my Christian life, I thought about dirt trails, small towns, a small group of people that stopped along the way and gathered wood and maybe shared a meal around a fire and then sang Kumbaya. Just a very rural kind of a setting um, that he experienced. I want to challenge you today about something maybe different, to begin to think that actually the first century in Rome was made up of very large cities. And that as we trace through um, the letters in the scriptures in the New Testament, and we're going from large cities to other large cities. I mean, we see the, the letters that we have that are named after different towns that we are familiar with, like Philippi and Ephesus and Colossae, that actually those places were very big. And even Jesus, when he pronounces judgment over seven churches, these are seven churches in seven very large cities. So let me take some time. We'll get to hospitality in a minute, but I want to set the context of what it's going to look like. So let me take some time just to talk to you about the cities and how they were populated. Rome, Alexandra, Athens, Antioch, Ephesus, Corinth, Jerusalem. These are all cities of hundreds of thousands of people. Rome in the first century is said to be somewhere between 500,000 and some say as much as a million people in the city of Rome. These, pop, these cities are densely populated, and that was part of the problem. Let me talk to you about density a little bit. Uh, Manhattan which has the advantages of giant skyscrapers, if you were to take how dense that population is, Manhattan is a, has approximately 100 people per acre. Now, if you go to Calcutta, which you know is going to be more dense, but it's actually um, 122 people per acre. The most dense city in, on our planet at this time is Manila. I've had the privilege of being at Manila, or maybe it's a privilege, or the challenge of being to, going to Manila several times. And I have gone through and spent hours on the city streets of Manila on a motorcycle, riding, splitting lanes, dodging traffic, um, making my way through. And I have two memories of the, the, the population in the streets of Manila. The first one is dodging streams of urine as mothers held their toddlers up to the bus windows for them to relieve themselves. If you can imagine splitting lanes and all of a sudden urine. And it, most of the time I was successful in dodging that. Most of the time. The second one was this. The, the, that the traffic and the population is so dense in Manila that um, after riding just a short time on a motorcycle with sunglasses on, whenever I would take my sunglasses off, my face... Around my eyes would be white, and then my face would be black with soot from the diesel pollution of, the, of that traffic there. The density of Manila is somewhere around approximately 200 people per acre. Antioch, which is a prominent city in the New Testament, and actually where Paul and Barnabas are birthed out of, and, and the missionary movement comes out of, Antioch is just about the same size. It's 195 people per acre. Rome, estimates are made, and there's research in a book called The Triumph of Christianity by Rodney Stark. I'll refer to that in just a minute. Rome is said to be 300 people per acre. Without the advantages of buildings that go much over four or five stories. This city is incredibly dense incredibly crowded and incredibly populated. And with that density comes problems. Health, cleanliness, and the filth that came along with this density. Life expectancy in the first century Rome 
is about, if you were, at the year of your birth, when you were born, you would, you were, the life expectancy was 22 to 25 years. If you live through the first year, then your life expectancy expanded all the way to 40. You could expect to live to be 40, but that was it. That was it. Soap was not available yet to the masses. It was not, crea- it was not invented chemically to be uh, mass produced. And so only the richest, richest people had soap. Nobody else has soap. Um, water is carried in jugs from public fountains. The, there's very little cleaning of clothes, very little cleaning of your home, very little cleaning of your body. Rodney Stark says that when human density is high, urgent problems, problems of sanitation arise. And here's a cover if you'd like to read more about the triumph of Christianity by Rodney Stark. Sewage was handled primarily by chamber pots and pit latrines. This is a quote from Rodney Stark. The smell of sweat, urine, feces, and decay permeated everything. Outside, mud, open sewers, manure, and crowds. Human corpses, adult as well as newborn, were sometimes just pushed into the open sewer. No wonder everyone was so fond of incense. Because it stunk. The city smelled terrible. Worse yet, flies, mosquitoes, and other insects flourish where there is stagnant water and filth. This is the cities. This is the cities that Christ would encounter. That the early church would encounter. And these cities were also marked by Incredibly long and prominent outbursts of disease. In the year 165, history records that there was a plague that lasted 15 years. I mean, we could barely stand COVID for 11 months. 15-year plague that was much more deadly and that killed one-third of the Roman Empire. No knowledge of germs and how they are spread. No no medicine that could help treat uh, these situations. And one-third of the population dies. No one knew how to treat the stricken. And no one tried. No one even tried. Except Christians. Illness and physical afflictions probably were the dominant features of everyday life. They were the common conversation that everybody talked about. On a regular basis. Women especially were susceptible to disease and health problems. because Mainly because of childbirth. The average woman would give birth between four and six births per woman. And they would only live, the, the life expectancy for a woman was 25 years old. So she would have four to six children by 25 and then probably die of disease at some point. And widespread abortion that was happening as well was unsanitary and also put women at risk. And so the first symptoms would appear. The daily uh, Roman and Greek cults and religions of the day have zero emphasis and call and example of compassion and hospitality. And so there's no motivation among the masses. There is one group of people and one group only. This is historically verifiable. It's it's unarguable. There's only one group, and it's the group of Christians. Christians very quickly start outliving everyone else because they're giving simple just care to people, making sure that they have water, making sure that they have some food, making sure that they have a place to rest and they're not out in the street. And in this, Christians begin to gain great favor among the people. And they outlive the um, folks that are not a part of Christian community. The early church in Rome and in other large cities becomes primarily known for its hospitality to the poor and to the suffering. This is the context. This is this is the smelly air that the first century Christians breathed when they received this letter to the Hebrews. 
We're in Hebrews chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. In that context, the writer of Hebrews says this. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison. And those who were are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. This verse gives us three things, at least three things. A con the consistent commands of hospitality. The amazing adventure of hospitality. And then the challenge behind hospitality. Let's begin with the Christian command, which is verse 1. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Perhaps the best known command of Christ is to love your neighbor as yourself. This is keep on loving. This is the present active imperative voice of keep. It means to start and keep doing for our net from now on. Make it a regular part of your life. The trait of Christ and his community of people were followers that were merciful to people around them. Hospitality, a uh, working definition for hospitality through this series Felipe has given to you um, over the last couple of weeks. He said that it, hospitality is the practice of welcoming, hosting, and caring for others, especially strangers, with uncommon warmth, generosity, and love. Jesus said it this way. When the Son of Man comes into his glory and all the angels are with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates um, the sheep from the goats. And he will keep the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, come on in, take your inheritance for the kingdom is, you, is for you, and it's been prepared for you. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. See, this, this is so much a part of the Christianity that we know, that we think, oh, everybody must have thought this way. No one did. You with me here? No one did. These are new virtues birthed in the teachings of Christ and the example of how he lived. And they begin to change the whole world. His brother, Jesus' brother James, in the book of James, after, named after him, he says this in chapter 2. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of them says to you, uh, if one of them you, of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In fact, he will go on to teach in the book of James that if you can't respond to the needs of people around you, your faith is dead. The apostle John in 1 John chapter 4 said, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. In fact, if you trace hospitality through the New Testament, that word is used over 10 times. And it's always described in the context of family, love, and commitment. Phileo is a regular, where we get our word Philadelphia, the, brother of city, um, the city of brotherly love. Um, we get this and we realize that it, it's always accompanied with um, hospitality in the New Testament. We're commanded to do it without complaining or grumbling. For some of you, I don't know who, so don't volunteer. It's a requirement for elders who lead the church. Felipe said, and I love this, so I wrote it down. He said, when radical love is most displayed, God is often most revealed. The early church moves with generosity when the the Roman and Greek cults and religions of the day don't have any of it. And this is a consistent, this is not just a one passage, kind of a one-off thing where, yeah, you can show some hospitality. It is a consistent command. But it's also an amazing adventure. Look at this, verse 2. 
Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Are you kidding? There could be an angel among you, and we wouldn't even know it. And if they claim to be an angel, they're probably not. So just so you know. It says, do not forget to do this. Hospitality apparently is easy for us to forget because three times in this chapter, twice in the passage that we're looking at, and again at verse 16 of the same chapter, it said, don't forget, keep going, keep remembering to practice hospitality. And it's this wonderful combination. I want to say it one more time, even though Felipe's already shown you. The, The word for hospitality is this wonderful combination of phileo, which is brotherly love, And Zanos, which is stranger or foreigner. Think someone really different than you. Like me and Felipe, we're really different. I heard in the message a couple weeks ago, he said he doesn't like country and western. Well, I like country and western enough for both of us. Okay? So it's this wonderful love and the foreigner or the stranger or the person that's not like you, and coming then to get together to paint this beautiful picture of what hospitality is like. But then comes the adventure. Hospitality to angels? And the word here for angels, it's like, oh, it's probably not real angels. No, it's the word used for angels throughout the New Testament. I can remember a, a time just recently where my wife and I were in Auburn, California, and we were going to the one o'clock service, the matinee. The only people, most of y'all can't go to the one o'clock, so don't even try because you're just too young. The only people that go to a movie at that time of the day are old people. My wife and I, she's not really, but I qualify for that, so I got us in. We went to see a movie called American Underdog, which was a story about a football star, Kurt Warner, who was a quarterback, and he came from nothing to become a starting quarterback and won a Super Bowl and became the most valuable player of the NFL. And he just had a wonderful story. And in there, you also met the coach that gave him a chance, a guy named Dick Vermeil. Dick Vermeil is a San Jose State grad and kind of a local hero. And so he, um, he was the coach of the NFL team that that Kurt Warner played for. So after the movie, I do what old folks do. We go to the bathroom. And I'm at the, I'm at the I'm bathroom, and I'm at the urinal, and also, I notice a guy out of the corner of my eye. I don't really look. It's not polite. But um, I notice there's a guy over here, and he's older than me, and he's shorter than me. And so that's pretty, I'm pretty short, so he's actually shorter than me. And so I'm standing at the or urinal, and he says, hey, which is usual. Gals, you, you probably don't know this, but guys actually can talk to each other in the urinal. You can't do that because you got wall between you, but we, get, we don't. And so he says, hey, and I said, what did I say? Hey, <laughs> right. And he said, did you enjoy the movie? I said, I did. My wife and I both really enjoyed it. We're Kurt Warner fans. And he said, I am too. Um, I happened to be at that Super Bowl that was in the movie. I said, shut up. You got to go to a Super Bowl? He said, yeah, um, my brother's Dick Vermeil. Um, exactly. I'm like, what? Are you kidding? You just never know who's standing next to you at a urinal. <laughs> there could be something going on in your life, and you could be entertaining an angel, and you don't even know it. The adventure of hospitality, following Jesus and living the life he is calling to you to, is the most exciting thing you can be involved in. If your faith is kind of bummed out and boring, you just need to start practicing a little hospitality. Because angels might show up. Angels. What an adventure. You just never know who might be standing next to you. The third thing, though, in all of that, is that hospitality is hard. I'm not talking about the kind of hospitality where you... you invite your family over. I mean, for some of you, some of you that's hard. But, um, you know, looking to someone right now after you get through with his service and say, hey, why don't we go out for lunch after? I mean, that's a beautiful thing. That's a wonderful thing. I hope you do it. I hope you do it on a regular basis. But look what this passage says. Verse 3. Continue to remember those in prison 
as if you were together with them in prison. And those who are mistreated, as if you yourself were suffering with them. That you would recognize the grace that's extended to you and then begin to extend it to others. Rodney, the thesis of Rodney Stark's book, The Triumph of Christianity, and many, many other historians also believe that this was the impetus for the successful change of Rome and the Roman Empire by Christianity in the first couple of 300 years. Is that they began to express compassion and kindness and love to not just their families, which would have been unique, but to express it to people who are really not very much like them at all. And when you understand the biblical narrative, when you understand the, the, the broader picture of Christ and what he's accomplished for you, this is the, um, the natural conclusion of how you should live. If you have a, a biblical narrative about anthropology, and anthropology, it's, it's, it's a big word, but all it really means is the study of mankind. And if you begin to do that and understand what Christ has done for you from a 30,000-foot level, then you can begin to say that, you know what, it's really about what Christ has come to kind of implement is forgiveness and reconciliation. That God the Father recognized that there, were a, there was a great debt that separated us from him, and he so longed to have relationship with us that he allowed Christ to meet all of the requirements of the law of a holy God so that by faith, when we place our faith in Christ's work on the cross, we can receive forgiveness that is complete and absolute for everything in our past and everything that will ever come in the future. And that forgiveness is not just given to you so then you can go and then do whatever you want. It's not fire insurance for eternity. It's actually given so that something called reconciliation can happen. That the division be between God and mankind can actually be bridged. And that that bridging help happens because of the love and the work of Christ. But it happens through the people of God. As they offer love and acceptance and kindness. Because people deserve it? No. Because you got it and you didn't deserve it. And so this love and reconciliation now becomes... The, the deeper you understand that, the easier hospitality is. The easier it is to see people as agents of grace that maybe just haven't recognized it yet. That you would move into that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, If you love those who love you, what credit is that? Even sinners love those who love them. If you're good to those who are good to you, what credit is that? Even sinners do that. Hannah Arendt said, forgiveness is the only way to reverse the re irreversible flow of history. That there's, a, there's a current that we live and breathe. And in that current, unless love steps in, it runs a horrible course. The last words, some of the last words of Jesus on the cross were, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So you've got this consistent command of the scriptures. You just can't deny that people of God are called to hospitality. And you've got this invitation to a wonderful adventure that you just don't know who might show up. But you've got a challenge, too. It's hard. It's hard to extend. But the better that you understand how God extended himself to you, the easier it becomes to extend to other people, even people that aren't like you at all, even people that might vote differently than you, even people that like country western music. <laughs> so what would this look like specifically for us today? Let me take just a little bit of a time to talk about how we might get started. 
Vivek Morthy, our Surgeon General, said that it's hard to put a price tag, if you will, on the amount of human suffering that people are experiencing right now. You can feel lonely even if you have a lot of people around you. Do you know there's lonely people in this room? There is. Because loneliness is not about the quality, the quantity of your connections, but about the quality of your fellowships. Across all age groups, people are spending less and less time together, especially among young people. Where as much as 70% of young people ages 15 to 24 say they have no significant interaction with other people on a regular basis. 70%? So we can get started by a couple of things. We can become people that exercise honor over contempt. Romans 12, verse 10 says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Contempt is the feeling that someone is beneath your consideration. But a proper biblical anthropology is actually it's impossible to think anyone is below your consideration. Because every set of eyes you ever look into is a set of eyes that Christ died for. They have an errant worth because Jesus loves them. We can also begin to express agape love over cancel culture. Henry Nouwen said that love is stronger than fear. Life is stronger than death. Hope is stronger than despair. We have to trust that the risk of loving is always worth taking. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So not only expressing agape love over cancel culture, but also celebration over criticism. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people more than yourself. And then finally, to take the risk of exercising proximity over cynicism. It's quite easy to see all the pain around you, all of the problems that exist, all of the division that we, that we talk about, and all of the different schisms that are going on. It's quite easy to be cynical about all of that. But instead, because of what Christ has done, for you to begin to exercise proximity, to be willing to cross the street, to talk to a neighbor, to be willing to go across the cubicle, to be willing to go out of the normal sections of the student union building that you stay in and go and see someone else. People are lonely. People are hurting. And to exercise proximity changes, folks. Just after midnight on March 22nd, 2012, my wife Dana and I experienced every parent's worst nightmare where someone knocked on our door and said that our youngest son had died, who was 25. I read Bono's autobiography or was listening to it late, late, just recently, and he said about grief that it was like gravity doubled down on you. And I resonated with that. As soon as I answered the door, it was like gravity doubled down on me. Just to take a step forward, just to take another breath, just to lift my head, just to wipe a tear 
all seemed too hard. Just too hard to do. And I didn't want to see anybody. The next day, someone else knocked on my door. Her name was Amy. About seven years prior, she had lost a child. She came in and she sat down on the couch with my wife and I. She brought us enough food probably for the week. I don't remember what she said. Not a word. She just read some scripture with us and she cried with us. She stepped into our pain, got close, and gave us our first glimpse that maybe there was some kind of a life that was worth living after this pain. Two days ago, I got a call from a pastor friend of mine. And he told me of a pastor that we both know and, and love. And that pastor just lost his 26-year-old son. And the phone call was, Steve, would you, would you call him? Would you meet with him? How could I not? How can I not recognize the great grace that has been extended to me? And take the comfort that I've received to comfort others. I don't want to. I don't want to go into that pain. I don't want to be reminded of all the stuff. I don't, I don't want to. But Jesus would ask me to. And so I want to challenge you. I hope that you're inviting friends out for lunch and I hope you're in a life group and I hope you do Alpha and I hope you do all that is presented to you and I hope you become all that God wants this church to be. But I will tell you this, you will not be that church unless you also decide to walk into the pain, to practice hospitality when it's hard, to people that are hurting and are different and to do what you probably don't want to do. Not because they deserve it and not because you're super spiritual, but just because Jesus did that for us. Leaving the glory of heaven and taking on flesh and bone that he might bear sin's penalty. And now inviting us in it's hard. It's hard. But if not you, who? The other religions and cults of our day are just as void of it as they were in the first century. Jesus alone can bring life. Be that kind of person. Be that church. Pray with me. God, thank you so much for the extension of grace to us. You have been so, so good. And now you nudge us, you 
give us a loving push to take that goodness that's been extended to us and to transfer it to other people, to be a conduit of grace rather than just a sponge that soaks it all in, that you would instead allow us to be a conduit of the grace that flows into our lives and then we allow it to fill us and then flow out over the people around us. Would you give us opportunity to be hospitable even when it's hard? And as we exercise that, just by your grace, just by your kindness, may those that don't know you yet see our good deeds and glorify you. That all credit and glory might go to Jesus alone. And we ask it in his name.